Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about OpenGL 3.0 and 3.1, which was recently announced at GDC this year. Uh, show you how to take advantage of the new features and extensions to bring them to your own games. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the the techniques I'm going to call out, uh, some are more daunting to attempt than others, but the good news is we've released a lot of samples that pretty much have the code written for you. All you have to do is take it and adapt it to your platforms. Uh, so yeah, here's the link right there. Uh, we do we will publish all featured samples there, and yeah, it's a good thing to keep up with. Okay, so uh, let's start out with why you should care about OpenGL ES 3.0 and 3.1. Uh, so yeah, first of all, it was released at GDC this year, 3.1, uh, and, and it's a very important milestone for Kronos because in its extended form, uh, OpenGL ES 3.1 is at parity with desktop APIs like OpenGL 4.3 and DX11, uh, which could really help you differentiate your titles from the really crowded marketplace right now. So if you do follow these, it'll really give you an edge in the market. Uh, also, Android is dominant in the tablet market with 62% market share, and iOS with a second at 36. Both support 3.0. Uh, I don't know if they've passed conformance for 3.1 yet with the iOS devices. Next, OpenGL ES 3.0 is gaining market share, uh, mostly in the high-end tablets, which are becoming increasingly popular, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of those in the coming years. Yeah, so... Now we've covered the why, now let's go to the what and the how. So 3.0, uh, it's fully backwards compatible with OpenGL 2 ES 2.0, meaning that if you have a 2.0 coded app and just decide to pull out a 3.0 context out of the box, everything you've already written will automatically work. So this makes doing a fallback path to 2.0 very easy. So if there's some Features you want to cherry pick uh, from 3.0, all you have to do is wrap it up with some defines. Anyway, uh, so here's what we're going to talk about in particular. Three of the features that we pulled out that we think are the most bang for the buck. Um, but the rest are available to check out. If you do download the slides later from the article, uh, we have short descriptions on each of these, so you could see what will fit your game. Anyway, uh, beginning with precompiled shaders. Uh, precompiled shaders are like eating your vegetables. Pretty much everybody should do it. It's super easy to do, uh, and it could dramatically lower load times to really give a good user experience. Uh, if you check out the graph, it might be a little small to see, but uh, just running this very simple shader from this screenshot, uh, just basically outputting to the color buffer the colors of the cubes. Uh, very significant performance increase between pre-compiled compilation and runtime. So you can imagine if you had a lot more complex shaders, it would really benefit you to use this. So what is it exactly? Uh, pretty much, you can use your platform's native runtime environment to compile a shader. You detect the first run of an application and when it is the first run, you pull the program binary using this command, gl get program binary, and you store it to local storage. And then on sub subsequent runs, you can load it with gl program binary. This means that you only have the overhead of compiling on the first run, and every run after that, you get significant performance increase just by straight up loading the binary from the file. Uh, sample code, the one you're looking at right now, can be downloaded at that link there. Next, we're going to talk about instance rendering. Um, and it's good for rendering multiple geometry instances with a single draw call. So basically, instead of looping over every single draw, loop, draw, loop, draw, loop, draw, and going through the API every single time and accumulating all that overhead, you could just do one call, one time you're getting the API overhead, and you could uh, render 200 instances of something. Uh, you can also use the new um, the new system variable GL instance ID that's provided with GLSL version 300 ES, which is the GLSL version, the shading language released with 3.0. Uh, you use that; uh, it increments every time from zero every draw call. So your first instance of a, of an object will be instance zero, and you can use that as an index to your buffer objects that you've passed. So you can use this to differentiate each structure, like if you're rendering 
a hundred different people. You could give them each a different shirt if they're in the crowd, you know. It makes it a lot less, you know, cut and paste looking. So that's a really big help for keeping performance costs low. Sample code is also available right there. Multiple render targets is the next feature. Uh, it is a little bit more complicated than the rest, but we do have a full sample available for that as well. Uh, basically, it's good for situations where you need to go through the whole pipeline, multiple passes to write to different render targets. Uh, instead of going once for the color buffer or once for a normal buffer or normal map, specular map, etc., you can only do a single pass. And uh, you would write with this variable GL frag data instead of GL fragment color. And you replace it with the index of whatever render target you have. So if your color buffer is render target zero, you would say GL frag data zero is equal to this color. Uh, you could do the same with the second one would be your normal. So just put the normal data there. Uh, the benefits to multiple render targets with regards to differ deferred shading is that for every light in your scene, you don't have to do it per object. You could do it for the entire scene itself. So for each fragment, you'd run it instead of just over and over again. So you'd get all your maps ready, and then you would do the calculations at the very end. All right. Next, we're going to go into OpenGLES 3.1. Uh, 3.1 is a very important upgrade for Kronos because a lot of independent hardware vendors have common units in their GPUs uh, that they use on their new mobile platforms. Uh, this API basically takes advantage of all that new hardware. So, you know, tessellation shaders wasn't previously available in software, but it wasn't hardware. And now you can. So here are all the new features that came out with uh, 3.1. The highlighted ones are the extensions supported by the Intel Baytrail platform, which is our new high-end tablet. Uh, so we pretty much have every extension covered aside from one. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go through a few of these, just an overhead view. These in particular. All right. So we're going to start with compute shaders. Uh, what are they good for? They're good for post-processing effects, deferred rendering, visibility culling, computer vision, and particle physics. So compute shaders are a new shader that sits alongside the 3D pipeline, but it's independent. Uh, that, but that still means it's good with working with 3D primitives and you know stuff like that. Uh, it has no defined input and output, meaning that it works through side effects of writing to textures and images and buffer objects. So a really good reason to use this is when you don't want to go through the entire 3D pipeline just to do do operations on a full screen ah, full screen quad. Uh, it avoids all that spinning up the vertex shader and all that stuff. Uh, you compile it just like any other shader. Uh, in, instead of issuing a draw call, you use GL dispatch compute. Uh, you can think of compute shaders as grids of work. Uh, you pass in an XYZ value for the number of work groups, which is the first level of a batch that you're going to run. Uh, and each work group has a set number of threads that you define in the shader. So each instance of a thread in a work group can reference itself and you can use that as an idea to know where you want to write to. So if you have a texture, you're doing a full image post-processing effect, you'd say this group of or this work group is going to work on this section, this on this section. Uh, anything that could take advantage of parallelism of the GPU architecture is what you want to use compute shaders for. Um, yeah, and they could also uh, access any OpenGL ES textures and buffer objects. Next, we have tessellation. You might have seen some of these demos. Uh, they're really good for setting up level of detail systems. Uh, for example, if you look at the picture, you can see the top is a lot less tessellated than the bottom. Uh, in most cases, you would want to have the untessellated version far from the eye to where you can't discern little details. Uh, the bottom is where you want to break it up. Things that are close to the eye that could really bring a whole bunch of graphical fidelity to your game. Uh, the way they work is, oh, well, first let me talk about why you use them. The displacement mapping is a very important one. Uh, you can do very intricately detailed meshes without having to pass every single vertex through the vertex uh, shader. So instead, you pass a set of control points, which is a new type of primitive called a GL patch, 
those control points are operated on by the vertex shader, uh, but you have to you do computation per control point rather than per post vertex kind of. So it really reduces the bandwidth and memory footprint of your application. Uh, displacement mapping, like I just talked about, the complex hair modeling, subdividing services, which is the difference of the two pictures. Each patch would be a different tessellation level. So you'd have you you'd subdivide the surfaces towards the front more so than the back. And you can use them by uh, compiling a GL test control shader. You have two new pro programmable shaders and one fixed function. Uh, the tessellator is the fixed function, which receives the tessellation details from the tessellation control shader. You set the inner tessellation factor and the outer tessellation factor, and you get a whole set of primitives out, or set of vertices out from the fixed function shader into the evaluation shader. And you could think of the evaluation shader kind of like the vertex shader in that you can apply displacement mapping offsets to those vertices, uh, that's where you would basically change the height levels. If you're doing any kind of terrain in your game, you're definitely going to want to take advantage of tessellation. Uh, we also have a full sample, the one you're looking at there, at that, that site. Next, we have geometry shaders. Uh, we did some work with SSX uh, this year. Uh, where they would take a console port of the game and basically adapt it to mobile. It's kind of an experiment, but it paid off really well. As you can see in mobile, they had to significantly reduce the draw distance to get good performance. You can look at the bottom screenshot. Uh, as you were playing, it's kind of hard to see here, but you would see you know, the draw line moving with the character. It was very distracting. So they implemented a on-GPU particle system. That's where you could see that fog. Uh, and that particle system that would usually be done on the GPU was actually done fully on the or on the CPU was done fully on the GPU uh, using the transform feedback mechanisms. Uh, the developers told us that they were able to do one third of the work with those results, which looked pretty good. Uh, so what are they good for? Efficient par particle systems, like I just talked about, uh, imposters, which are basically sprites, uh, 2D quads that you paint on. It could be good for 2D games as well. If you're trying to really push it. Uh, Non-photorealistic rendering, procedural geometry, uh, shadow volume extrusion, culling, and layered rendering. So the way they work is you could set the input and output in the layout qualifiers in the shader. They can actually be different types, which makes this useful for toggling between wireframe mode and regular. So you could see if your culling is being efficient, as one example. Uh, you could do some really neat effects with that, even offset from uh, a surface face normal uh, to make cool explosion effects like that. Uh, you can also create oracle geometry. You have complete control over each vertex. The primitive is passed in, and you can emit vertices one by one or up to the max on that input uh, primitive. Uh, whenever you're done outputting primitives, you just do end primitive. Uh, and then it'll go on to the next stage of the pipeline. Uh, next, you just create and attach it just like anything else, and you're good to go. And the last extension I'm going to talk about is fragment shader ordering. Uh, this comes in handy for effects where you're dealing with transparency, and you have, um, you know, draw order independent problems, independence problems, basically. So, what it does is it gives you some control in the shader and s for each fragment you can say anything beyond this point will happen in the order I submitted the draw call. So, and what I'm referring to is the begin fragment shader ordering intel is anything beyond that line you can guarantee that any texture you're reading from will have already been written to by a previous draw call. So this is good for doing blending equations, um, you know, this uh, adaptive volumetric shadow map that you can see in the picture. It really gives you a, a great deal of power to do these effects. If you weren't using this fragment shader ordering technique, there would be back and forth flickering that you'd be able to see, and it'd be uh, super annoying because every frame it would update and it'd be a different randomized value if there's data races and stuff like that. 
So this can really dif differentiate your title if you want to go into it. Uh, give you something specific to you. Uh, yeah, and you just query the extension with GL Intel Fragment Shader Ordering. We also have a sample available. Unfortunately, this sample isn't ready for ES yet, but the desktop version is available. So if you want to get a jump on that and get prepared for when we when it is ready to go, go ahead. Uh, in summary, uh, mobile graphics hardware and APIs have come a very long way, and they will continue to quickly improve. Uh, the companies that jump on this uh, and really push it to the limits and differentiate their titles are the ones that are going to benefit most from this. Uh, use the new core features and extensions to distinguish your game, kind of the same thing. Increase performance with minimal extra work by pre-compiling your shaders and using instance rendering when possible. The more performance you gain from that is more you can work with to do cooler graphic effects. Uh, before I go, I just wanted to say we have a booth downstairs demonstrating some of these games. SSX, the game I showed you, we have a running demo of that. You can come check it out. Uh, also, some of our tools, like the graphics performance analyzer, where you can dig in and dissect the scene and find out where your problem areas are. Um, we have a couple events, too. The Buzz Workshop in Seattle on August 7th. I don't know. There was one last week here. I don't know if any of y'all went to it, but it was pretty fun. Right on. <laughs> Uh, next, we also have the IDF, Intel Developer Forum, uh, September 9th through 11th. And here's some links you can check out. I highly recommend downloading the slides. There's a lot of good information here, a lot of good resources. And that is it. Uh, don't have time for questions, but come visit me in the booth and I'll answer any questions you all have. Uh, thank you. <laughs>